Hey everyone. So because of the pandemic, the National Cryptologic Museum, which is affiliated with the NSA, has been putting on a series of free online lectures and they've been covering a wide variety of interesting topics. They recently reached out to me to ask if I could give a lecture about the Zodiac ciphers, and I agreed, and just the other day I gave the lecture and it went pretty well, so I thought I would share the video of the lecture as an episode of Let's Crack Zodiac. The lecture is basically a general overview of the Zodiac case and the letters that he sent and the ciphers and other mysterious elements of his letters and postcards. I also have a section at the end covering the copycat Zodiacs, or letters sent from people that claim to be Zodiac but weren't Zodiac, and some of those have some interesting ciphers in them as well. So I appreciate you joining me, and here we go. Here's my lecture about the Zodiac ciphers for the National Cryptologic Museum. Thank you for joining in. Uh, my name is Katie Hoffman. I am the event coordinator here at the National Cryptologic Museum. Um, so we've been getting into the virtual events like everybody else. And uh, we've had a few lectures here online. And so one of those lectures is today. This has been very well received so far. Uh, we have a lot of people signed up and we're very excited about that. And we're very excited that David agreed to do this for us, for our crypto fans out there. And I'm going to pass it over to David Orantek. And I said that correctly, right? I hope. Yep. Yep. That's right. You got it. All right. I'll just, I'll just jump right into it. Um, thanks everybody for joining. This is great. Glad that you could all take the time to listen to me ramble for an hour. Um, I'll be talking about the famous serial killer known as the Zodiac Killer. He attacked and killed several people in North California in the late 1960s and the early 1970s. And he's well known for the many terrorizing letters and puzzles that he sent to newspapers. Some of his letters included cryptograms like these. Only one of them has been solved so far. And that's why the case has attracted tremendous interest. There's this you know, outstanding mystery about these remaining ciphers that no one has solved yet. So it attracts a lot of attention. It caught my own interest when I saw the ciphers online about 13 years ago. I've been a computer programmer for most of my life, and programmers sometimes think everything can be solved with a program. If you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, as the saying goes. Um, so I tried writing computer programs to solve the ciphers, and uh, I failed back then, and I'm pretty much still failing now, 13 years later. Um, but along the way, I, I built up a little knowledge about the ciphers, and I made a website called ZodiacKillerCiphers.com. It has a lot of cipher information and tools. And I went to some conferences and gave talks about them. Uh, eventually, I was invited to be on several Zodiac-related documentaries, and I got to write some code-breaking software for the FBI. And I also started a YouTube series called Let's Crack Zodiac, where I talk about different topics involving the ciphers. I'm having a lot of fun with that one. So let's go through Zodiac's story so you can get some background on where these ciphers come from. Zodiac's first official crime uh, was in December of 1968, uh, around Christmas time. Uh, David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen were teenagers on their first date and they drove to this Lover's Lane area on Lake Herman Road near Benicia, California. It was close to midnight, and a man came up to them and started shooting into their car. As they tried to escape, the killer kept shooting at them, and they both died at the scene. The police were puzzled by the attack. They investigated many suspects, but didn't make much progress on the case. Then about six and a half months later, on the 4th of July, 19-year-old Michael Mugeau and 22-year-old Darlene Farron drove to the parking lot of Blue Rock Springs Park in Vallejo, California. And that place was only about a few miles from the, scenes of the scene of the first attack. And it was also an isolated spot like the other location. And while sitting in their car, another car pulled in nearby and a man came up to them with a flashlight. They thought he was a police officer but suddenly he started shooting at them. Majot survived the attack, but Farron unfortunately died on the way to the hospital. Soon after that crime, 
the killer called the police from a gas station phone booth, and then he took credit for this and the December attacks. And once again, the police were unable to find the killer. And then a few weeks later, three different Bay Area newspapers received very similar letters in the mail from the killer. The newspapers were the Vallejo Times Herald, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the San Francisco Examiner. The writer of these letters was taking credit for the attacks on the two young couples. And he described a lot of specific details uh, about the crimes to try to prove that he was the killer. But included with each letter was one part of a three-part cipher. Each part was about the same size. It was arranged in this kind of grid layout and was filled with different mysterious symbols. In the letters, the writer claimed that this cipher contained his identity. He demanded that the newspapers publish the ciphers immediately, or else he would go on a killing rampage over that weekend. Altogether, the three-part cipher has a total of 408 symbols, and so that's why the cipher is often called the 408. Now, the Vallejo police wanted some help to break the ciphers, so they asked the Navy cryptographers who were stationed at nearby uh, Skaggs Island. And Skaggs Island was a top secret radio surveillance and cryptologic communications installation operated by the Navy. During World War II, they intercepted radio signals and were decoding secret messages that were being transmitted. They seemed like the perfect people to ask for help. Meanwhile, the newspapers decided to go ahead and publish the ciphers as demanded by the killer. Over that weekend, each paper published their part of the cipher with articles about the crimes. The articles mentioned the Vallejo police chief was not satisfied that the letter writer was the killer, and so he asked him to send more proof. By that Sunday, there was still no solution to the ciphers, and the killer did not go on his killing rampage as promised. The next day, Monday, the San Francisco Chronicle received a new letter from the killer, but this time he called himself Zodiac, and that was the first time he was referred to by that name, and it was a name that he gave himself. In the letter, he was taunting the police and giving more details about the attacks, as the Vallejo police chief was asking. And then two days later, the San Francisco examiner reached out to this man, Dr. Donald C.B. Marsh. They asked for his help to crack the cipher. He was a math professor at the Colorado School of Mines, and he was considered a top expert in cryptography. He was also a leading member of the American Cryptogram Association, or otherwise known as the ACA. And the ACA is a group of people who like to make and break ciphers as a hobby. And the group is still active today and has been around for 90 years. I think we've got a few members in the meeting today and present company included. But just as Dr. Marsh began to study the ciphers and before the Navy cryptographers could find a solution, this couple beat them to it. And this is Donald and Betty Harden. Donald was a teacher at a high school in Salinas. He and his wife, Betty, were reading the Sunday papers and they saw the ciphers in them and they became interested in solving them. And then after about 20 hours of work here and there over a few days, they uncovered the killer's secret message. They confirmed that the cipher was a simple substitution cipher and here's the message they found. It contains some misspellings and mistakes, but the meaning's pretty clear. It says, I like killing people because it is so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild game in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all. To kill something gives me the most thrilling experience. It is even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. The best part of it is that when I die, I will be reborn in paradise, and all I have killed will become my slaves. I will not give you my name because you will try to slow down or stop my collecting of slaves for my afterlife. Now, if you look at that section at the end, the last 18 letters there are garbled, and they don't make any sense. To this day, no one knows for sure why that section is there. Maybe it's just junk that he put in to try to fill out the message so that the, all three parts would be the same size. Or maybe there is some hidden meaning in there that no one's discovered yet. A lot of people have tried to pull messages out of it, like names and phrases, but uh, there's so many thousands of possibilities that they can't be verified. Some examples that have come up are um, Robert Emmett the Hippie. You know, you could rearrange the letters to kind of spell that. And then uh, another one is Timothy E. F Fiebert. <laughs> Uh, so, but that's just, you know, two out of however many thousands of uh, possible names that you could produce. So the Hardens made a, um, 
a really impressive achievement with their cracking of this code. Here was a couple, they weren't professional cryptographers who broke this code. And so how did they do it? It turns out Donald knew a little bit about code breaking. He had an interest in ciphers when he was a boy, but he also gave a lot of credit to his wife, Betty, who was very tenacious about trying out new ideas and thinking about what the killer might be saying in the message. Donald knew from books about cryptography, about the importance of frequency analysis and the importance of looking for patterns. For example, he saw these doubled symbols, the squares. So maybe the squares stand for the same letter. So this is a uh, page from a Fletcher Pratt book called Secret and Urgent, and it's about the history of making and breaking codes. It includes this table showing which letters are most commonly doubled in English. It shows that LL is the most common doubled letter in English, and that's because LL appears in a lot of common words in English, like will, all, still, and so on. And it turns out Zodiac used the word kill a lot in his message. And so there's a lot of doubled L's from all those um, appearances of the word kill. Now the Hardens also noticed other repeating patterns such as these, which start with the forward slash symbol and involve the squares. Since the squares probably stand for L, they guessed that these patterns might stand for the word kill. Betty thought that the killer might be egotistical and would be talking about himself. So she guessed that he started the message with, I like killing, and she turned out to be right. From that point, they went through a lot of trial and error and came up with the correct solution, which they sent to the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper, and then they gave it to the Vallejo Police Department. And eventually their solution was confirmed by the Vallejo Police Department, cryptography expert DCB Marsh, he, uh, what he did was he took just the first line of the hardened solution, and then he derived the rest of it himself by going through the same code breaking steps, but not relying on the rest of the hardened solution. So he independently came up with the same answer. And then the FBI crime lab also confirmed the solution. So the, the Hardin's achievement was a great example of how ordinary citizens can make useful contributions to criminal investigations. But unfortunately, the message they found didn't identify the killer. So Zodiac's crimes continued. And in September, these two young college students, Cecilia Shepard and Brian Hartnell, they were having a picnic out in Lake Berryessa, which is in a popular recreational spot in uh, Napa County. And a strange man approached them and he was wearing this bizarre costume and had a executioner style hood and a bib with a cross circle symbol, the same symbol he included in his letters, which came to symbolize him. And then they held them up at gunpoint and then tied them up and then they thought that they were being robbed. But then the man took out a knife and stabbed both of them repeatedly and viciously. He left them for dead and then went back up to the road to their car and wrote this on the door. He put his um, cross circle symbol on it and he mentions Vallejo and the dates of his attacks on the other two young couples there. And then he includes the date and time of the crime he just committed. September 27, 1969, at 6.30. And he mentions the method by knife. Then after writing this message on the door, he went up to a payphone, 30 miles away from the crime scene, but it was only a few blocks from the sheriff's office in Napa. And then he called the police at that payphone to report his crime. And then meanwhile, Brian and Cecilia were both found alive and taken to the hospital. Brian survived, but Cecilia died in two days. Police felt that the same person committed all three attacks, but they still couldn't find him. Soon, the killer broke his pattern of targeting young couples in isolated areas. Two weeks later, on October 11th, in San Francisco, a cab driver named Paul Stein picked up Zodiac and drove him toward Presidio Heights. But when they got there, Zodiac shot him in the head and took his wallet and car keys. He also tore off a piece of the cab driver's bloody shirt. There were teenage witnesses there who saw the crime and saw the killer wiping down the cab, so they called the police. The two cops who respo responded saw a white male walking on the sidewalk and into the front yard of a nearby home. But they didn't stop him because for some reason, the police dispatcher told the officers to look out for a black suspect. So police kept searching for the killer but never found him. A police artist 
worked with the witnesses and produced these two sketches. And the killer was described as a white male, 25 to 30 years old, about five foot eight or five foot nine in height, with reddish brown hair, a crew cut, heavy rimmed glasses, and wearing a navy blue or dark black jacket. Then a few days later, Zodiac sent another letter to the San Francisco Chronicle, taking credit for killing the cab driver. And then he included a piece of the bloody shirt to prove that it was him. He also took credit for attacking the other couples in Vallejo and Napa. And he bragged about the police not being able to catch him. And he threatened to shoot school kids in school buses. And this created a panic in the Bay Area. Then almost a month later, Zodiac mailed a greeting card to the San Francisco Chronicle, and this time it included his second cipher. Once again, in his message, he makes a vague threat to commit more crimes unless the papers put the cipher on their front pages. The cipher is 340 symbols long, so it's often called the 340 cipher. To this day, it remains unsolved, and it's been 51 years now, so this has been an enduring mystery. Then the San Francisco Chronicle received another Zodiac letter the next day. And in this letter, he claimed that the police stopped and talked to him for three minutes after he shot Paul Stein, the cab driver. He bragged about all the clever ways he avoided detection and capture. And then he included details of plans to build a bomb that could blow up school buses. There wasn't a cipher in this letter, but he included a, a puzzling feature here. The cross circle there has marks along the circumference, the little X's there. Uh, it's not known if the marks have any meaning, but certainly there's been a lot of speculation. Fast forward about five months to April of 1970. He sent another letter to the San Francisco Chronicle. This one has a small cipher at the beginning. He says in the letter, By the way, have you cracked the last cipher I sent you? And then he writes, My name is blank. And then that's followed by a 13-letter cipher. People have come up with many different names and phrases that fit the cipher, but these solutions are pretty much impossible to verify because there are so many of them that fit, and the cipher is way too short. Cryptographers like to have longer ciphers to work with. And then two months later, in June, Zodiac sent another taunting letter to the San Francisco Chronicle. This time the letter came with a map and a new cipher, which said... The map coupled with this code will tell you where the bomb is set. You have until next fall to dig it up. And then he also marked Mount Diablo on the map with his crosshairs symbol. Mount Diablo is a tall mountain that can be seen from much of the Bay Area. Like the last cipher, this cipher is pretty short. It's only 32 symbols long. And here I've highlighted the only repeating symbols that are in it. And so all the unmarked ones are unique. And what that means is the cipher's too short and there aren't enough repeating patterns. And some cryptographers hate this. There's not enough, you know, the cipher's not long enough and there's not enough uh, repetition in it. So the cipher's even more hopeless to solve than that 13-character cipher uh, because you can come up with thousands of messages that fit perfectly into this, into this cipher. So the only real hope in solving it might be to find some extra evidence somewhere that points to the real key. But a month later, he offered a hint for that cipher at the end of another letter. In this disturbing letter, he wrote about how he'd like to torture his victims. On the last page of the letter is this hint referring to the earlier map cipher. It says, P.S. The Mount Diablo code concerns radians and inches along the radians. So a radian is basically a way to measure angles. So it looks like there are some measurements involved with the cipher solution to the map code. But even with this hint, we haven't been able to verify solutions because there's so many that are possible and there's so many different ways you could construct a solution using measurements. But maybe if somebody used their solution to find Zodiac's supposed bomb, then that could probably prove that they were right. A few months go by and then Zodiac mailed a threatening Halloween card to San Francisco Chronicle reporter Paul Avery. And he was covering the Zodiac story for the paper. There's no cipher included in this, but the card has some puzzling elements to it. For one, there's this strange symbol that was on the envelope and inside the card. It's this zigzag with the dots, has a little Z underneath it, and the right side of it looks like a little F. Does this symbol mean anything? 
People have come up with many ideas, like maybe it's some kind of map, or it's linked to symbols used for branding cattle. There's a lot of um, similar looking symbols in that area. Another interesting thing about this mailing is he wrote some things in different directions. Inside the envelope, he wrote, sorry, no cipher, in two directions, like an X or cross shape. And then on the back of the card, he has paradise and slaves written in two different directions, along with four methods of killing written vertically, by fire, by gun, by knife, and by rope. So the way he wrote these made a lot of people think that maybe the message in the 340 is written in a similar crossword style. So that's an option that uh, people have been exploring for a while now. So then a year goes by and then Zodiac sends another card. This time, he appeared to be taking credit for the disappearance of a woman named Donna Lass. She was a nurse who worked at a casino near Lake Tahoe. And she went missing after a shift back in September, about six months before Zodiac sent this card. To this day, no one knows what happened to her. The card seems to include hints of her location. It shows an illustration of Forest Pines condominiums from a newspaper ad. And he pasted in phrases like Sierra Club, Around in the Snow, Peek Through the Pines, Pass Lake Tahoe Areas. And many people have tried to interpret these clues to try to find her, but so far with no success. And then he sends another letter with strange symbols. This one's in uh, 1974. This is about three years later. And at the end of this letter, he includes his usual threat of committing more crimes unless the papers publish his letter. There's no cipher, but he drew these mysterious markings at the end. No one knows what they mean. They kind of look like fragments of letters. People have tried to rearrange them to turn them into words or suspect names. Some of it's interesting, but so far it seems to be a dead end. So that's pretty much it for his letters. His letter writing campaign had been going on for about five years. So let's look back on the ones that had ciphers. These are the three that are still unsolved. The two ciphers on the right are the short ones, which means the solutions are just about impossible to verify. But the one on the left, the 340, it's long enough for cryptographers to test and to verify proposed solutions. So a lot of people tend to focus on that one because there's still a chance of solving it. So let's look at some of the stuff the FBI's cryptographic unit tried. This is a snippet from the FBI's files on the Zodiac case, which are in the, uh, but they're publicly available. One thing they tried was to use the previously recovered key. What that means is they took the solution key from the first cipher, the 408, you know, the, the key that the Hardens discovered, and they tried to decode the 340 with it because it has a lot of the same symbols in it. But unfortunately, that didn't work. They also noticed that 20% of the cipher text involves brand new symbols that weren't in the 408. And these new symbols are highlighted here. Since there are more unique symbols, the difficulty of the cipher has gone up, and the 408's key wouldn't include these symbols at all. They were also looking at what's called psychic use of variants. So they found these groups of repeating symbols. So they were looking at these groups of symbols in the cipher. For example, let's look at this group here, the M backwards L and the half-filled square. These groups are interesting to cryptographers and I'll, I'll show you why. If you take these symbols, the M, the backwards L and the square, and you highlight them in the cipher, if you look on the left, you see that the symbols are, are highlighted anywhere they appear. And then you write them down in order like this, then you'll notice a pattern. If you read that from left to right, you get this sequence that repeats the L, the half-filled square, and then an M, then an L, half-filled square, and an M, and then once again, L, square, M, and then it repeats three more times. The reason this is uh, interesting is because the first solved cipher, the 408, is filled with these kinds of repeating patterns because Zodiac systematically assigned symbols to letters by following a predictable pattern. The patterns don't happen as much in this the 340 cipher, but they are still here. 
so that could be evidence that Zodiac did something systematic when he made this cipher, that he actually went through some process to encode his message. He was following a set of rules. Now here's some more mysterious patterns in the 340 that have attracted a lot of attention. Repeating groups of symbols are very interesting to cryptographers because they can point out repeating pieces of the hidden message. But the patterns marked here, they repeat in multiple directions. If you look at the one on the left, it has R, J, I going from left to right, and then there's a piece that goes vertically, R, J, and I, and they kind of connect on the same symbol. Similarly, the pattern on the right has a repeating sequence that goes backwards B, dot, and backwards C, which reads from left to right, and then there's a, it's connected to the repetition of it that goes top to bottom. So there's, it's an unusual uh, repetition of those uh, three symbol groups. And so that leads to a lot of questions. Why are these patterns here? Did Zodiac write his message in multiple directions? So that would be reflected in the enciphered symbols. Or is there some other encoding scheme going on that could make these kinds of patterns? So whatever rule system he's following to make the cipher is somehow prone to make these kinds of patterns? Or is this just something random that has no meaning? They're just coming up just out of coincidence or chance. So this is, this is still a big mystery, and it's, it's been a head-scratcher for me for many years. Another curious type of pattern seen in this cipher is called repeating periodic bigrams. Here are some examples. If you look at these, the backwards P and the plus uh, symbols, they all repeat with the same arrangement, kind of like diagonal from each other. And there's four of those. And there's another example of this three-character sequence, the X, the cross circle, and the dotted circle, which repeat in the cipher text in the same kind of arrangement. And these are really interesting for cryptographers because they might indicate some kind of uh, manipulation of the plain text message before the symbols were assigned. So maybe instead of writing the message out in the normal way, he did something to the message and, you know, to uh, rearrange it before enciphering it. And this could be reflected in the repeating groups of symbols that get spread out like this. So they're getting spread out in kind of a systematic way. So there's a lot of research in this area trying to figure out, well, what kind of rule system could he have been following that could make these kinds of patterns appear? Because they... They appear in the 340 more than expected. It's kind of like a statistical anomaly that they're appearing in it. So it's, it's very interesting uh, for cryptographers to look at. So what about possible solutions to the 340? You know, over the years, many of them have been proposed. This is a, a well-known example. Back in the 80s, Robert Graysmith here published his famous book about the Zodiac case, which attracted a lot of interest in the case again uh, after it had gone a little bit cold. In the book, he claimed that he solved the 340, and his solution is here. It says, Herb Cain, I give them hell too. Blast these lies. Sleuth should see a name below killer's film, uh, pills game, and so on. It doesn't really make much sense. Uh, and the FBI analyzed it, but they weren't really impressed. Uh, there's a clipping from the FBI file here, which has a report of their cryptanalysis. And the, the highlighted section has the quote about the solution, which is that this sense of rightness is completely absent in the proposed solution, which was a, kind of a harsh conclusion that the FBI came up with about Graysmith's proposed solution. But if you're curious about why his solution was rejected, you can check out the first episode of my YouTube series, Let's Crack Zodiac. I go into a lot of detail in that video about um, what's wrong with his solution. But uh, anyway, over the years, many people have used flawed solving techniques like Graysmith did. Um, sometimes the solutions get a lot of attention, but so far none of them have been confirmed or verified because Mainly the solution methods are wrong 
or they can't be tested the way the 408 solution was. But I hope people will keep trying because they come up with a lot of really creative ideas. It's, uh, it's really impressive what people come up with. Even if they don't get to an actual solution, they do some pretty interesting things. So who's still working on solving these ciphers after all these years? So I could think of a few main groups of people. There's the scientific community. They have researchers from different areas like computer science, cryptography, and mathematics. And they develop new ways to break codes and publish papers about their progress. You know, they haven't solved the 340 cipher yet, but they've come up with like new ways to, to solve other ciphers. And so that's been useful. Then there are the law enforcement agencies like the FBI. The FBI has a division just for code breaking. The 340 is on their top 10 list, but they're probably very busy with active crimes and can't spend much time on Zodiac ciphers since they are part of a cold case. And then there's the online communities of enthusiasts. They're in forums and social media groups. Many of them are devoted to the Zodiac case, and there are also groups dedicated to cryptography and cipher-related mysteries. And these communities attract people from many different walks of life and backgrounds. So people from all areas contribute a lot of interesting ideas uh, from a lot of different perspectives. And it's, um, it's challenging to sort through it all, but they come up with some interesting stuff. So the big question is, well, why isn't the 340 solved yet? Why is this cipher so hard when the first one was broken so quickly? So a couple possibilities are, maybe it's a substitution cipher like the 408 but we just haven't found the key yet. I don't think that's the case because we would have probably solved it by now if it was like the 408 because a lot of other ciphers that are like that are easy to solve. Or maybe Zodiac made too many misspellings in his plain text message because he was known to be a bad speller. He had a lot of misspellings in his letters and the first cipher. But I don't think that that's the case that would cause the cipher to be unbreakable because there's code breaking software that's really uh, good about breaking test messages that purposefully have a lot of um, misspellings and typos in them. Uh, another possibility is maybe it's written in a different language. Yeah, that's possible. Um, Zodiac wasn't known to write in any other language than English, as far as I know. And also, uh, a lot of the, uh, the people that use code breaking software have tested the cipher in different languages and haven't come up with anything. Uh, but who knows, there might be something to that. Another option is that maybe Zodiac screwed up his encryption method. Maybe he messed up the steps so, somehow. So he had a system for creating his cipher, but he, he bungled it. He screwed it up. So that's a tough one, because if he did do that, the only way to solve it would be to reverse his mistakes somehow by identifying what they are and working it backwards. Um, so that's, uh, that's a tricky one. Another possibility is he used an unexpected encryption method that hasn't been tried yet. So cryptographers just haven't gotten around to trying a particular method yet. Or maybe it's a method he invented that no one thought of yet. Or final possibility, maybe there isn't a message at all and it's all just a bunch of random symbols to keep people busy. He did like to screw around with people. You know, the bomb that he talked about never turned up. So I think he just liked to mess with people. So that's a good possibility that there really isn't anything there. Uh, my opinion, though, is that there is a real message because there's uh, some weird statistical anomalies in it that could be explained by him following some rule system to, to hide a message. So I think that there is a message, but we just haven't figured out what kind of cipher it is. And so it's really hard to solve a problem when you don't know what kind of problem it is. So that's the first thing that we face is like, well, we have to identify what kind of cipher this is before we can solve it. And that we're still failing at. So the only hope of solving this thing will be to keep trying out new ideas. And even if we can't solve it, the new ideas can lead to ways to solve other problems. So how can we solve it? We can figure out the cipher type, either systematically or by somebody making a lucky guess. You know, hopefully one of those two things would happen. And then we can make better code breaking software or develop new code breaking techniques for that particular cipher type. Unless it's a cipher type that already has a known good method of solving. 
But will a, a solution to the 340 actually help the case? A lot of people ask that question. Uh, maybe, maybe not. It's impossible to know unless you can get to the message, right? The plain text for the 408 didn't really help that much. I mean, it gave some insight into the killer's mindset. And it told us that, you know, he was able to create a homophonic substitution cipher. That was the particular kind of cipher it was. So that he had a genuine ability to hide a message in a legitimate cipher. So it taught us that. So maybe a solution to the 340 would help us unlock the remaining unsolved short ciphers because it would tell us something more about how he thinks about cryptography. But even if we don't solve the 340 or the solution isn't that useful, trying to solve it has kind of been its own reward. Cryptography research continuously improves when there are big targets like this because it motivates people to try to come up with better ways to do cryptography. So my advice is to keep trying. So that's, that's it for the Zodiac stuff, but I wanted to show some of the letters that have not been confirmed to be authentic Zodiac letters. But these letters also contain ciphers, and they might be from copycats or pranksters, people inspired by Zodiac's persona. So here are some of the letters that have ciphers in them. So the letters shown here were mailed by someone from Fairfield, California, which is not too far from Vallejo, where the first crimes took place. They were mailed to local papers in uh, December 1969. So this was about a month after Zodiac killed the cab driver. The FBI analyzed the cipher but couldn't come up with anything. And the ciphers are too short. But it, but it looks like the sequences of symbols here were simply copied from Zodiac's 340 cipher. So perhaps the letter writer was just decorating his letter with um, cipher material, the pre-existing cipher material from Zodiac. Here's another one. This one was sent from Fairfield, California in 1971. Uh, it was sent to the San Francisco Chronicle. This one also looks like a Zodiac copycat. It starts with a cipher and it ends with Zodiac's crossed circle symbol, you know, his iconic symbol there. Um, the handwriting doesn't really look like Zodiac's other letters. Um, and the cipher does have a real solution. It says something like, uh, this is the Zodiac speaking, why can't you stop me? I can't stop killing, stop listening to phonies. And then there's the, the rest of the solution has a kind of this disgusting thread in it that I won't repeat here. Uh, but feel free to try to crack the cipher to, <laughs> to see what that threat was. And then here's a postcard someone sent in September of 1990 from Oakland, California. It's addressed to Celebrity Cipher at the, the Vallejo Times-Herald paper. And the Celebrity Cipher was a puzzle feature commonly published in newspapers. And they would be enciphered quotations from famous people. And readers would decode them for fun. The cipher on this postcard uses a lot of the same symbols Zodiac used in his ciphers. Um, nobody knows who wrote this postcard. And I think the cipher is still unsolved. So have at it. Try, try your hand at this. Here's another letter and cipher mailed to an Albany, New York newspaper in August of 1973. This writer used Zodiac's crossed circle symbol on the envelope and the letter. And he threatened to kill a new victim whose name and location is hidden in the included cipher there on the bottom of the letter. Uh, he said he would do it at the exact time of 5 p.m. on August the 10th. The FBI actually decrypted this cipher, but they redacted the part that potentially mentioned a name, the, the potential name of the victim. But the rest of the solution was Albany Medical Center. This is only the beginning. And so people have been speculating on what the decoded name that was redacted might have been. The image quality of the beginning of the cipher is bad, so the attempts to get the decoded name out of it have been a little bit messy. So I don't know if the the name has been accurately gotten from the from the cipher yet. But it, ultimately, the letter writer did not follow through with the killing, fortunately. And then uh, this is the serial killer named Heriberto Seda. He was otherwise known as the New York Zodiac. I mean, he was blatantly copying the Zodiac uh, in his crimes. He was attacking and killing people in New York City in the early 90s. 
And apparently he admired Zodiac so much that he was inspired to send similar taunting letters with ciphers in them. And then this one here was sent to the New York Post. And in the card, he calls himself Zodiac. And he includes a list of his victims and how he killed them or attacked, or attacked them, much like Zodiac did with, um, in his letters. And he also includes you know, the cross circle symbol and he includes a cipher, these weird, they look like uh, maritime flags. And it turned out that this cipher was a simple substitution cipher and it was cracked by a journalist at the New York Post where, the, um, where this letter was sent. And the solution was something like, this is the Zodiac speaking, I am in control, be ready for more, yours truly. He was eventually caught and convicted and sent to prison on a 232-year sentence. So, yeah, good riddance. So that's pretty much it. That's all, folks. We've seen a lot of ciphers from the real Zodiac, as well as all those fake Zodiacs he inspired. I, uh, I wonder how much longer the real Zodiac ciphers will remain unsolved. I think there's still hope that one day someone will crack Zodiac's 340 cipher. And maybe one of you will be the lucky one. <laughs> I appreciate everyone listening, and um, I want to credit these sites, which I recommend if you want more info about the Zodiac case. Uh, they're at the top there. ZodiacKiller.com. That was one of the first Zodiac Killer sites. ZodiacKillerFacts.com has a lot of good information. ZodiacKillerSite.com has a, a really good um, forum. Um, and a lot of the um, cryptography enthusiasts are on that site too, you know, exploring different ways to attack the Zodiac ciphers. And then ZodiacCiphers.com also has a lot of good information about the case. And I've got all my contact information there below if you want to reach out to me. i got my email address, dranchak at gmail.com. You can reach me at, at dranchak on Twitter. Check me out on the website, ZodiacKillerCiphers.com. And if you want to check out my YouTube series, just go to YouTube and search for Let's Crack Zodiac. Thanks again, and I guess uh, we'll open it up for questions. All right. Thanks, David. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I've been monitoring the chat. You can hear me, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. I've been monitoring the chat. Uh, let's see here. We have a couple questions, and then I'll let and then I'll unmute everyone so they can ask questions in person. Uh, let's see here. Um, from Steve Bates, is the possibility of the symbols in the cipher being associated with astrologic symbols of the zodiac? M is somehow associated with Scorpio or possibly Virgo, and then something extrapolated from those. Hmm. Yeah, I think a, a lot of people have uh, made comparisons of the symbols with astrological symbols. I think even Graysmith was uh, thinking along those lines because, I mean, he did call himself Zodiac. Um, but, right. but Zodiac didn't make any like other overt references to astrology that I'm aware of. Um, there, there were some theories about, you know, maybe he was committing his crimes, you know, uh, correlating to dates that have astrological significance and things like that. Um, but as far as the symbols themselves, I think that he was just, um, just coming up with symbols to, to represent the, the letters of his message. And since he was using what's known as a homophonic substitution, he needed more than 26 letters, uh, more than 26 symbols. So he had to use up a through Z, and then he had to draw these extra shapes in. And then I think those were just the ones that he decided to pull in. Hmm. All right, from Ashley, was the killer aware of how his first cipher was cracked before his later letters were sent? I believe so, because when the articles came out after the Hardens uh, cracked the first cipher, there was some detail in some of those articles about, you know, the patterns that they had found and the, the weaknesses of the cipher, like the repeating, um, the repeating symbols and, you know, how they kind of got to the answer by exploiting those weaknesses. So he may have used that information uh, by the time that he came up with that second cipher to make it more difficult to crack. All right. So I've allowed people to unmute. So if you have a question, you can go ahead and unmute and ask David. A follow-up question on that last one. Um, what was that time frame, I guess, that he had to kind of come up with that new cipher after he learned how the first one may have been done? 
Uh, so the first cipher, the Hardens solved it on August 8th of 1969. And then over the next few days after that, the articles were appearing in the papers, you know, talking about, uh, talking about their solution. And then the 340 cipher didn't come out until, I think, November, yeah, November 8th. So it was August, September, October. So that was three months later. So we had a good amount of time to come up with a new scheme if that's what he did. Thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions? I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, you can. Yeah. Uh, so with the, uh, you know, the advances in facial recognition software, is it possible to take that drawing of the Zodiac and maybe run that against a database of, I don't know, people who spent time in California prisons? Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't know how well that would work with, um, I imagine you could come up with some something that could do something like that, but I'd imagine it'd be kind of inaccurate because uh, I'm not sure how uh, much detail you can get in a sketch just, just off of someone's memory, you know? I mean, there's probably important features that you can get, but um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm not an expert in uh, facial recognition, so. <laughs> I had a follow-up question too. Okay, David. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so as far as the, I'm sure, I'm sure the FBI profiled this guy. And what what did they say about him in terms of you know what what his personality was like, what, what kind of education he had, what kind of job they thought he had? I'm not aware of the FBI doing a profile. They were mostly uh, they were mostly involved with um, looking at the letters and doing you know. Uh, checking for fingerprints, you know, looking up uh, fingerprint records, looking for matches in their databases, and then doing the cryptanalysis on the codes. I think it was other agencies that were doing the, uh, the profiling. And um, uh, I'm not sure how they, you know, I'm not, I don't know that familiar with the profile that they came up with. There was a couple that I remember mentioned in the papers, like they were trying to say he was really insecure or he had this like, sexual dysfunction or something like that. Um, I remember one of them uh, said something like he was maybe a latent homosexual. You know, this was back when that was considered uh, deviant. <laughs> um, and so there's, I think there's been kind of a variety of, of profiles built for him. But there was another, uh, Rossimo, I think, I'm probably misremembering his name, but he came up with a, with a profile based on the uh, geography of the crime scenes, you know, where they were located and um, the general descriptions of the, uh, of the perpetrator. So, and, yeah, you might want to try to find that. Mike Rossimo or something like that, I think, is the name of the guy who profiled. Okay, so, yeah. thank you. All right, David, um, Kevin O'Brien said, is there a familial uh, DNA hunt? I think there is some DNA stuff going on. I, I hear rumors here and there. You know, I don't know exactly what's going on, but apparently they're doing something that the, uh, uh, the police have some, uh, some kind of sample that they're working with. Uh, but I don't know what the status is, and they've been, they've been kind of talking about it, or they, they mentioned it um, over a year ago at least that they were mm -hmm. doing something with it, and uh, but I haven't heard any updates. I don't think there are any updates yet on that. If they did get something to match, then it could be, if it is in the stage where they're doing forensic genealogy, where they're looking for a familial match and then doing the family tree reconstruction to try to you know, narrow it down, I know that part, it can be very time consuming because you're looking at, you know, thousands of cousins, you know, trying to figure out which family line might lead to the right person. Um, so hopefully they are doing something like that. And it's just, you know, we're not hearing about it because it's just taking time. But uh, yeah, it would be really interesting if if that's where they were. Mm -hmm. um, Rebecca Law said, do we know why he stopped writing letters? You know, about no idea. I mean, we won't know unless he gets caught or the, you know, we find uh, more information somewhere. But uh, there's all sorts of theories about that, like, Maybe he was arrested. Maybe he was arrested for some unrelated crime, but you know they didn't figure out that he was the Zodiac, uh, or maybe he died, 
or or he could have you know lost interest for a while um you know btk the famous serial killer who would also write taunting letters he he stopped for a while i mean he eventually started back up again but he went for many years without without writing the the police and um so so yeah those I mean, maybe he just um or he could have just lost interest who knows mm -hmm. Uh, Sally Lockley said, why do you think the cipher hasn't been broken yet? Uh, I think it's mainly because we don't know what kind of cipher it is, and it's not one of the simple ones. If it was one of the simple ones, meaning like, uh, you know, the normal kinds of cryptograms that you would see in the newspaper, you know, substitution cipher, uh, or the basic kind of the transposition ciphers that cryptographers are very familiar with. If it's not one of those simple ones, uh, that's a good reason why it might not be solved yet because he's using some obscure method or uh, some homemade method you know sometimes people come up with homemade methods that there aren't they aren't like any other uh, cipher type known to cryptography so it's a matter of trying to discover or imagine what steps he might have gone through to encipher his message and uh, you know that's that's an interesting uh, research question uh, but it could also be that you know, maybe he messed up his process, so he had the right um, system, but he went through the wrong steps and messed it up. Or he just wanted to mess with people, and he just put a bunch of random symbols together to make us talk about his cipher 51 years later. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I actually have a question. Uh, a couple months ago, I watched the documentary, uh, what was it? Most Dangerous Animal of All. Uh, yes. Yes. I believe you're in that, right, David? Yeah, briefly. <laughs> yeah, briefly. Uh, I just wanted to know your take on that, and I and it was debunked, right, at the end. I remember yes. correctly. Yes. Yeah. The um, yeah. The whole thing was this guy Gary Stewart, who um, was adopted, and he when he grew up, he wanted to find out who his real dad was. Found out that he was this guy Earl Van Best Jr., who had kind of a sketchy record. He thought that. His father looked like the um, Zodiac composite, the, the mugshot, or the um, sketch, I mean. And so he went on this kind of quest to, to find things that connect his father's history to, uh, to the Zodiac. But his evidence is very slim or non-existent. It's just based on like him trying to force his dad to be the Zodiac. You know, the evidence doesn't really support that. Um, but he wrote a book about it with a true crime author and the book became a New York times bestseller. And then eventually that ended up turning into this docuseries that you watched the most dangerous animal of all. And the premise of that was that they were exploring the possibility that his father was the Zodiac, but it turns out to be more of a story about Gary Stewart and his, um, uh, his, uh, uh enduring persistence to, to try to convince people that he was right, that his father was indeed Zodiac, but not, not actually having any good evidence for it. So they brought me in to, do, to look at the, um, the cryptography claims that he was making, because he was finding his father's name in the ciphers. And so I was showing them how that you can find just about anybody's name using the methods that he was using. So that was one of the, the bad, um, you know, the, one of the weak uh, parts, pieces of evidence that he was using. So. It was an interesting experience. They, um, you know, a lot of times the documentaries don't want to, they, they, they basically want to give you the impression that they, you know, made progress in the case somehow or that they actually found a good suspect. But in this case, the documentary uh, kind of concluded that no, this guy's not the, um, not the Zodiac, but this, this guy, Gary Stewart's uh, interesting case in, in himself of, um, you know, what happens when you get uh, obsessed about this idea that, you know, your family members are the Zodiac Killer. And that has happened to actually uh, quite a number of people over the years. They just get really fixated on the idea that someone in their family is the Zodiac. And they try to find all this evidence to support that. And so far, their evidence has not been um, very compelling. Right. Yeah, it was very interesting. Um... Let's see here. Uh, Sean said, are we assuming the misspellings are because of poor education? I think that's hard to say because 
a lot of what he was doing in the letters was trying to craft this like persona of himself like uh like trying to set him set himself up like a like almost like a comic book villain a comic book character you know larger than life you know that everybody would talk about and be fearful of and um so the the misspellings may have been just like a decoration of his persona uh so it's not you know it's not clear that it was because his um it reflects his education level or anything especially since in some cases his um, misspellings were inconsistent. Like he spelled the word right in one place, but wrong in some other place. Right. So it could have been deliberate for all we know. Right. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. All right. Does anybody, I believe that's all the questions in the chat that I've seen. Does anybody else have any questions if you want to unmute yourselves um, sure. and ask David? Hey, David, I have a question. My name is Ed Giorgio. Um, so a question, first of all, about the um, 408 cipher. By the way, I've worked on this off and on for about 45 years. And like you, I've written a ton of software. So uh, the, uh, it was uh, quite ingenious to solve, uh, to solve 408. It was based on, as you point out, recognizing the double L's. I will, kill, thrill, et cetera. Um, but in, in retrospect, when going back and looking at other methods to solve 408, this thing about um, the cyclic use of variance, which results in uh, some interesting pairwise alternation statistics, uh, one can go through that uh, and look at those, that, those statistics very significant in that data, and one can go through and reconstruct that cipher, the 408 cipher, and solved by methods other than the one that was originally used. And so that's what a cryptographer does. They go and they practice on something and they develop new methods and then they go on, they go on to real results. Well, having gone down that path, as many others have, and written a lot of stuff, uh, one of the things you discover about 340 is that all those alternation statistics are, are very prevalent. Uh, in the uh, 340 cipher. So it's a very good hypothesis, uh, you know, supported by a lot of statistical evidence that the very last step of that in, uh, encryption of the process involved uh, the, a process similar to the 408. So one of the possibilities is that prior to that last step of encrypting the plain text, is that he pop, he could have taken the taken the messages, taken the lines out of the, uh, excuse me, extracted from the columns rather than extracting from the row. And he, and he could have, in a sense, transposed the cycle. And uh, in which case, after the transposition, you'd still have transposed plaintiffs. And then the second step, if he took it out, uh, you would see all the same alternation st stats, which you do precisely the same as 408. So I'm, I'm with you here that I think it's like uh, the 408 cipher. I'm fairly certain the last step was uh, encipherment using cyclic use of variance and that you can pretty much prove with the stats. So um, I uh, haven't been, been working on it for maybe 10 or 15 years but perhaps go back and give it a try. Perhaps you've motivated me. But I just want to say I I agree with everything you said here, and that uh, I too sort of hope have a lot of hope in this puzzle. And you know, if you're a good analyst, you're the infinite optimist, and you never give up. So those those are kind of two qualities. And uh, I think there's enough people around that absolutely will solve this eventually. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, the. Um... Uh, about the cyclic use of variance for the 340, it's definitely in there. I mean, you go, you can go through and find those, you know, repetitions, but it's not, uh, it's not as strong of a signal. If you look at it statistically, it's not as strong of a signal as it is in the 408. So either it's, yeah, yeah so it's a little bit more random than, than the 408 by that, uh, res in that respect. So it makes me wonder if, you know, it wasn't strictly the last step, you know, of him doing the, the homophonic substitution as the last step, because it may, there may be some other process that's like weakening the, uh, the, the, the cyclic variance somewhat. Uh, so that's, a, that's an open question. Sure. 
So you can you can make us well. We could talk maybe we could talk about this some other time. But yeah, I enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, there there's a lot of uh, research going in on the transposition side. Like uh, there's uh, there's a software developer on uh, uh, one of the forums who created a piece of software called AZ Decrypt, which is um, a homophonic substitution solver. It's really good and fast, but it includes a lot of transpositions in it. So he's already gone through you know, like tens or hundreds of thousands of variations of transposition ciphers. And uh, so far, nothing's come up yet. So, you know, I've run a bunch of experiments too, and still nothing. So uh, it's still, still an open question. All right, in the chat we have, oh, we have a couple of people talking. Sally said, has anyone figured out anything about the little X's on the circle, any theories? I believe that was one of your slides earlier on. Oh, the the X's on the on the cross symbol. This one, Is that it? Yeah, no, that's. There's a lot of speculation about it. Like, like I don't know if like it could refer to. You know, sometimes people will do things like they'll do map overlays, and try to see where the X's might be marking. You know, depending on where you put the 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 cross symbol. But you know, map overlays are right. tricky. Yeah, the overlays are really tricky because you have to get the scale right. You can put it on any size of rotation that you want to to make it seem significant. So it's uh, I don't yeah I don't think anything really solid has come out of that yet. Right, Dana Marie was saying, could it be geographic art or even oh, uh, time related? Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Possible. All right. I think that I think that's it. Uh, thank you for your time. Yep. Um, okay, so David, if you want to go ahead and go back to your slide with your contact information. Oh, sure. Yeah, um, and everybody has our the uh, National Ecological Museum. I sent you guys an email, so you have my contact information. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and reach back out. Um, and uh, thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. Thank you for those who stayed and listened to the Q&A. This was absolutely fantastic, David. We thank you so much and appreciate your time. Uh, and knowledge to this. This was fantastic. Um, and uh, for everyone else, uh, the National Cryptological Museum will continue with virtual events. You can go to Eventbrite. We have a lecture, The Power of Packaging, which is going to talk about tamper packaging um, in the government, uh, and that's in December. So go ahead and sign up for that. Uh, and I believe that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. And uh, See you next time. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thanks for everyone who came and listened. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.